Hi, everybody. Um, John Groves from Micron. And um, this is a little more of a uh, proposal for how we need to do things down the road uh, with CXL3. Um, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about how to make shared FAM, fabric attached memory, work uh, in a way that gets us some leverage where it, and it doesn't end up like 3D crosspoint where it's hard to use and it doesn't get used. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, I know, for sure. Um, yeah, it is missed by a handful of people. <laughs> so um, I thought about calling this uh, meet the new abstractions, same as the old abstractions, because uh, that's kind of the approach I'm trying to take. Um, so my goals in talking about this are to raise awareness of uh, fabric attached memory capabilities um, to point out the need for a shared scale out FS DAX file system, uh, which I'm gonna try to convince you is important. Um, and then to start an, a dialogue about the architecture and I'll describe a prototype we have. Uh, I've got some ideas about the architecture, but I'm uh, not of the impression that these ideas are gonna survive all the way through. Um, so real quick, a lot of what we've been talking about is what I would call pooling. That's where some memory gets given to a host, it gets online. And uh, a lot of interesting work being done there around tiering and stuff like that. Uh, but with sharing, um, it's uh, not gonna be online in most cases, I claim. Online memory gets zeroed. If you're sharing, it's uh, not a case where you wanna zero it because uh, you probably connect into it to find contents in there. And oh, by the way, that's a lot like persistent memory, right? So, um, and actually, can anybody confirm whether the 3.1 spec got released? Uh, no, okay. There's a handful of things that can be talked about. <laughs> it was gonna come out today, then it's tomorrow. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Surprise, everyone. Yeah. It's yeah. There there is one someday. Um okay. Uh, yeah, I know. Now, now that I did that, it might not. Um okay. So uh CXL shareable memory uh looks like tags capacity. Uh there will be a way if you know the tag to find the DAX device. Um and so you could imagine putting data sets on raw tagged capacity, um, i.e. raw DAX devices, and apps could open it. Uh, but I claim, and I've got some backup info on this, that's not gonna be good enough. There's a world full of apps that know how to open data sets in files, um, and we should let them do that. Because if we do that, we get a ton of leverage. If we don't do it, then there's a world full of apps that need to be modified. Um, so what does it look like? Uh, the, the CXL devices are DCDs. Um, oh, this is hard to read on this screen. Um, the uh, DCDs are effectively devices with an allocator built in. And so, but what gets allocated is tagged capacity. Um, there are cases where it's not tagged, but it doesn't make sense to do that if it's shareable, because you need to agree on which which one's which. Um, so that's enough about that. Um, some observations about shareable memory. It uh, doesn't make sense to online it. It's going to be zeroed. You know, um, The most accessible use cases are things that already know how to deal with data sets and files. Um, it's PMIM like I've already said that. Uh, cache coherency, you have some options. Uh, there is a hardware supported cache coherency mode, but the laws of physics apply. That's going to be expensive. I don't think, my opinion, uh, it's going to be attractive for some things, uh, but software managed or cases where you're reading and not writing are going to be really interesting because they don't have any problems with uh, the cost of the coherency. Um, and real quick about FS DAX. Uh, this kind of unfolded over the past few months as an epiphany for me. Um, the VFS layer already lets you have a file 
that maps to some special purpose memory. And uh, that's kind of what you'd like for shareable FAM. The only problem is that the way, uh, the way that existing FSDAX file systems are implemented, um, they have write back metadata. And that's just something you can't mount in more than one place. Although technically, you can mount it read only from more than one place. Uh, but that's hacky. Um, but so if a file has the S DAX flag on it, and if it's paired with a DAX device that has the right functionality, then if I M map it, I'm doing exactly what I hoped I would be doing, which is I'm doing cache line level accesses to the, to the DAX memory, which in this case, the interesting thing is if it's shared. Um, so can we enable it for a lot of use cases? Um, there's the column on the right is kind of the data science and AI tool chain, you know, Jupyter and Pandas and NumPy and Apache Arrow and et cetera, et cetera. Um, these things share a lot of infrastructure for dealing with data sets and files. And, um, uh, and in fact, they've done some things that are really helpful for fabric attached memory for reasons that are actually a little different from the reasons we care about them. Um, Apache Arrow, for example, is a, uh, what the data science community, the developers of that, they call it a zero copy format. And the idea is that you wrangle your data all the way to where your columns are vectorized in memory, you know, packed like a C array, so that vector instructions will run on it and computation is efficient. Um, by the way, that's how you'd like your data that you're gonna share in FAM to be laid out. Uh, particularly if you've got SDAX files pointing to it, so you map it and you're just really accessing it. Um, and so, let's see, uh, uh, in these kinds of data sets, read-only data is common actually too. Um, and again, can we make this ecosystem deal with raw DAX? Yeah, one app at a time we could. Um, but if we have a file system that can give you access to it, then we'll get them all. Now, uh, it's still a subset of those use cases that are interesting, especially the ones where the data is actually packed in memory the way you'd want it. Question, Dan? I was going to ask you, like, it, are, are, are any of those using like uh, multiple processors, um, on, at least on the same host, like uh, uh, ma doing a map share of the same files? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and we've run experiments. I don't have data on to share about this, but. Um, we've got a good set of sort of plausibility arguments around it's like take apache ray that's a effectively it's an orchestrator it's an orchestrator for your ai or computational data science kind of workloads um which i'm not up here as an expert on but i'm observing them and learning about it uh, it's really typical that you start with a big data set and then you shard it up and kick off 250 processes to each work on a piece of it um, a really interesting use case, and one that I believe isn't difficult to demonstrate the value of, is start with that big data set and shared FAM as a zero copy data frame. Uh, then each of the sub jobs will run a query against that data set to get the subset it's supposed to use. That's already part of what Ray does. Um, and actually we're showing a demo at uh, supercomputing this week where the value of not having to move the data around actually uh, overcomes the fact that the CXL memory is slow right now. Um, and so, because what, what, what would you want to do with FAM? Well, you'd want to have like more FAM than you can fit in a server. You know, when I was in school as a physics major, we used to say computationally, there's two kinds of problems, the ones that fit in memory and the ones that don't. Um, and that's still true. There's a lot more memory and at Micron we're in favor of that, but, um, so, but if you've got data sets that are really huge, even if you're sharding up the computation on them, uh, it can be a, it potentially is a real win to put them in fam where you've got more of it than you can fit in a server. And then in some cases you can run computation directly against that. Yeah, it's probably slower both in terms of performance and latency, but you can fit things you couldn't. But also you can have it there for querying out what you wanna do, um, the individual workers work on. 
And in some cases, those will be uh, moved into DRAM for that. Um, so I think I'm going to try not to say a whole lot more about these use cases. Um, and uh, OK, so this is really just about why not DAX? Why, why won't DAX just enable us for a lot of apps uh, by itself? So I'll, I'll leave that uh, unaddressed. Uh, but the slides are online, and I'm absolutely happy to talk to anybody uh, who wants to uh, discuss it. Um, so existing FS DAX file systems, um, the way, so I've studied this stuff because we have a prototype. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, they do write back metadata. The metadata is mixed into the memory with the data. Um, and so that's just not multiple mountable. Um, they also do some things that I think can be avoided here, uh, allocate on write. You know, the prototype we've got is pre-allocate. So the procedure is special for creating a file. Once a file is created, the procedure for using it can be exactly the same as using any file you know, extra points for doing it via MMAP because that's really doing the thing you want to enable here. But also, uh, and then there's some constraints like uh, truncate's a problem. <laughs> right. Didn't Linus once years ago say we lost the key to the clue box on a list talking about truncate? <laughs> Pretty sure he did. Um, okay, so the current implementations just can't scale out. So here's what I think the requirements are. Um, it needs to be a, an FS DAX abstraction that lives on top of tag capacity. Uh, files have to efficiently handle VMA faults. That's like the kind of the main thing file systems do, right? The system says, where's the page at this offset in this file? Because there was a page table miss following a TLB miss. And so that's gotta be handled fast. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we're exposing memory. We want it to be at memory speeds. Um, we have to distribute metadata in a shareable way. That's something that addresses something that isn't done that way in the current DAX file system because they were put there for a different reason. They were put there effectively to subdivide uh, NVDIMs, PMIM. Um, and finally, it has to tolerate clients with a stale copy of metadata. And so, uh, somebody might think of more requirements. I want to hear from you. Um, so what do we have right now? Well, started with a RAMFS clone, uh, added an IOCTL to the files to say, okay, here's the extent list of, FS, of, of DAX uh, extents that back you. Here's how big you are. And then uh, that gets set up and the SDAX flag gets set on the file. At that point, the VFS layer knows what to do with that file, provided the interactions between the file system and DAX work. Um, and right now they work the same way they do in XFS and there's a couple of issues there, but uh, I'll get to those in a minute. Um, so uh, there's a log format Right now, it's implemented as a uh, append-only log structured file system. So files can be allocated. You can dump data sets into it. Uh, there's a master who gets to actually append the log and do the allocations. There are clients who consume the log and make notice from time to time that it got appended. Um, and so, you know, when you play the log, it instantiates all the files. It's, it's an interesting little twist to this because the metadata is local to each client. Metadata does not get written back to the log. Um, I claim to enable a bunch of apps that already know how to share data, that's actually fine. Um, but it's a thing that should be discussed and debated. Um, log play for the current prototype is handled from user space. I think that can continue to be true. User space just reads the log instantiates the files, calls the IOCTL to set up the, the allocation. Um, like I said before, files are allocated by the master. Um, and this is interesting. Data may be writable by clients. Um, the at the log play time, 
at each client, the file can be made writable or not. Um, and so this actually, if, if the software knows how to deal with uh, one writer, multiple readers, or multiple writers even, you can do that. You can also have the files be read only for everybody but the master, uh, that kind of thing. So, and there's a, uh, you know, there's a CLI that gives you the ability to allocate a file. It gives you the ability to copy existing files into it, you know, pre-allocate, put the data there. Um, and I claim this is actually sufficient to enable a lot of stuff. And we're, I don't have demo data right now, but uh, we're, we're playing with it. Uh, I hope to be releasing RFC kind of patch sets uh, pretty soon. Um, so, you know, looking at how it uh, works, MakeFS is master only. Uh, playing the log, you know, the master might remount the file system and need to play the log as clients would. Uh, creating a file, you allocate some capacity, create a local file backed by that space, that's actually create the file, then make the IFL call to turn it into a SDAX file. Initialize the data, put the data in and then commit a log entry. And uh, so then I'm waving my hands. I'm not really talking about how we distribute the log right now, but um, assuming that we can do this and this is eminently, I claim it's already working, um, then uh, you know, anybody who's watching log for appends gets visibility of the files that got put in there. And the policy for what they're write, you know, whether they can write it doesn't have to be the same for every client either. Um, and then usage, uh, POSIX read and write work because that works with DAX. It just looks like a mem copy. And uh, MMAP works. And that's the, that's the thing you're really interested in. Um, so let's see, there is one more problem and that is the PMEM versus DAX thing. Uh, Right now, um, if it's persistent memory, uh, it gets a block dev PMEM device. That device supports this IO map API such that the uh, VMA faults, I believe they go to the DAX device, but the DAX device knows to ask the file system. So the file system gets asked what, you know, translate this offset in a file to an offset on a DAX device. And then the DAX device finishes up by uh, figuring out what address that is or what struct page and reports it back. Um, but character DAX devices don't have, don't have a fully working IO map subsystem. So right now what we're doing is we're telling the system they're block DAX devices. Um, go ahead, sorry. Telling the, the PMM devices. Right, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we're telling the system they're PMM devices. And and that's fine as a workaround for that issue. Uh, I'm assuming that the, you know, the RFCs that we put out for this uh, will just have to solve that problem. And I'm sure I'll bug you, Dan, about it. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, um, so back to goals and plans. Um, and I'm kind of amazed that I've gotten this far in this time. Probably everybody's like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, but uh, I believe this is an opportunity to enable a ton of stuff. Really a lot of stuff gets enabled by this. Um, and again, the, the data science tool chain, they already figured out that zero. So a couple words about that. Um, what does the workflow look like? Well, there's probably some, some uh, comma delimited data that you're starting with some data set from somewhere. So you start reading that stuff into a data frame. Um, it's actually not entirely uncommon for like one line of Python code slinging data frames to, cut, to double the memory usage of the app at a given moment because they don't know how much they need to allocate. So they start taking it in and then they allocate some more. So that's why, and in these date workflows, you already interact with your data at a data frames and files level. So there's already this workflow where you convert it into a zero copy data frame that packs it. And, um, and the users of these workflows are already doing this kind of stuff. So um, 
that's what you want to do and put it into FAMP. You don't, you don't want to put your common delimited data in FAMP because it's inefficient use of the space. Um, and like I say, I hope to start posting RFCs and um, finding out who hates it and who loves it. And <laughs> Question, Yasin? Yeah, I, I'm, have you thought about the error handling flow here? Like the hardware industry has been trying to take the surface area of memory error, errors and contain them smaller and smaller so we don't like have catastrophic, catastrophic events, right? Right. But here we're going to have like a big file system that's shared across multiple hosts. I mean, if we have so, one memory error, error, how does it affect everybody? Does everything go down? Does just a set of jobs get killed? Can we, like, maybe we can give more thought to that? Yeah. So that's that's an area that I can't do real justice to right now. I mean, whoever read Poison and Machine Checked is down, right? Um, but uh, another thing about these, I don't think they're super long lived in general. It's like you're going to massage up some data, dump a set of data frames into this thing. Clients are going to mount it. They're going to do something. But in some, I believe in some contained amount of time, they finish and you unmount it. Like there's no way to delete these files right now. Like, you could. You could well. I can I can let you truncate it shorter or delete it if I don't reclaim the space because what I can't guarantee, at least without doing a lot of work, is that all the clients know I deleted something. So space that's been allocated to something can't be reclaimed without addressing that issue. Um, but that's you know so errors. I don't think it's unique to this. I mean, yeah, I think. Maybe you make a good point. If if it's constrained to short-lived work, maybe it's like you know you go hard, you go fast, you take a lot of risk for the performance benefit. Danger is my business. You live you live dangerously, <laughs> but if if the job only runs for a little while, that's right. okay. So maybe right. it's, I it's mean, not worth the return to figure that out. Well, I mean, I think it'll ride the coattails of whatever figures out that stuff too, because um. Uh, sorry. Is is uh, what you have so far predicated on the existence of back and validate, or are you claiming to uh, do like, for example, you have the uh, single writer, many readers, the intent to just instantiate the entire device and then just do a giant flush to make sure it's coherent? Or so, it's I, I believe this is orthogonal to cache coherent coherency protocols. When you're appending the log. You've, you're going to have to do write back and validate and things like that. Whoever's appending the log has to use locking to serialize both allocation and log append. Um, what the client applications do needs to make sense. So the, the easiest thing to say makes sense is the master dumps some files into there, makes sure the cache is written back. Everything's software coherency, but the clients are all reading. Okay. So then you're good. Uh, if they're writing, I mean, you know, a comment about the laws of physics. Um, cache coherency among multiple threads or processes on one machine is already expensive enough that we try really hard to avoid that. And that terminates at the processor cache. With fabric attached memory, whatever you do has got to go all the way out to the memory. That's going to be more expensive. Um, that convinces me that the killer app for this is probably not there, but it's important to be able to do that. But, um, yeah. So you're claiming, just to be clear, you're claiming this could be useful even on top of existing 2.0 infrastructure rather than having to wait all the way for 3.0 with some level of. Well, sharing 2.0 really doesn't do shared memory, does it? Doesn't really do, but. We have some of that. <laughs> right. Quote so unquote. if you've got shared memory, you can do this. Um, OK. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.